All right, welcome everybody. Card and I are here with a social spotlight. And today I went through the Rolodex and looked through my YouTube channels and I thought, who would be the best person to talk to us about travel tips and the best way to get to parks and all those things. And uh, really it came down to uh, Mike from Canopy Coaster. And the reason is because he has gone to so many parks and his, uh, I, I mean, like just if you look at his channel, just go to YouTube and type that in there or go to our show notes and there'll be direct links to that in his Facebook page. You'll find in an Instagram, there'll be tons of information. As a matter of fact, do you Mike release like every day? I feel like it's almost every day you almost put out a video. Yep. I release every day, whether it be a review countdown list or off ride footage, just cause I have a huge uh, backload of photos from over the years. Only recently I started taking video footage to complement those photos, but you know, I have enough video footage from all the parks in 2020 that I could probably post every day this year and still not run out of rides. That's crazy. How do you organize all that? Uh, I have folders on my computer for, you know, every park I've been to with photo and then by year then for each park. So I can go to, you know, Six Flags Fiesta Texas 2020 or Silver Dollar City 2018. Wow. That is, that is amazing. So when did you start going to parks? Uh, as long as I can remember, remember my parents took me to Sands Village in Storyland when I was, you know, age two or three. Rode my first coaster, uh, Rudy's Rapid Transit Coaster at Sands Village, and loved it ever since. I don't remember a time I didn't love amusement parks. So what I was going to say is, if you go to uh, your channel and you look for on-ride photos, you can go and see like some of those photos from when you were younger. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was browsing through a few nights ago, and you have uh, one from Universal Studios Orlando going through the Barney section. <laughs> right like a like a home father movie right yeah i posted that story as a joke just like oh i have this barney footage might as well post it and then right after i did that the ride and now the universal announced they were closing that show in that area and oh, so, so you didn't do it in response watch, i thought you didn't do it in response to the announcement you did it before the announcement i posted it when um it was just closed due to covid it wasn't announced it was closing permanently but there always has been a rumor where that ride would get closed because it didn't really fit in with Universal in terms of like stuff that's modern. Like if you look at Universal's kids area, it's kind of weird how you have Woody Woodpecker, Fievel from uh, what's it, American Dream or whatever that mouse cartoon is. Yeah, the, the yeah the mouse one where they go. The yeah, American. I think you're right. American, American Tail. Oh, American, American Tail. That's it. Yeah. And uh, Barney, where I don't know if kids today know those IPs. Does your daughter yes. know Barney? No, no, they do okay. not know. No, not okay. not at all. Not at all. It's, it's, there's definitely a gap in there. So I would agree. Uh, Dr. Seuss, they know. So like from a universal perspective, like that whole Dr. Seuss area, they know who Dr. Seuss is and everything, but they would not know Barney or uh, any of those things. Tom and Jerry is about the oldest they know. And that's only because I think maybe we they found a DVD in the back. <laughs> so, Anyways, you have a, an amazing collection of, of videos and photos. So I'm excited to to chat more about that later. Yeah, about how many parks have you been to? So it depends what you count as a park because it gets a bit of a gray area when you start getting to things, you know, the size of like ZDTs. Is like as a park or is that a family entertainment center? Or, you know, like um, just to pick one off the top of my head, like Power Play Entertainment Center in Kansas City. It's an indoor, mostly an arcade, but it has like five amusement rides. Where do you draw the line? I'd yeah. say anywhere between 200 to 250 when you get to that gray area. Wow. It's, it's Funny you mentioned that Monday, we actually in the log ride meeting actually had a conversation about tomfooleries because uh, they were there. Each of the tomfooleries we had uh, categorized slightly different. So we were trying to standardize. To totally, totally get it. But that is a ton of parks. And you said not just US. How many countries outside of the US? Um, I can list them easier than I know the exact number. You know, I've been to Canada, Mexico, uh, all over Europe, um, the UAE, uh, and Japan. Wow, that's pretty amazing. And uh, just so for, for me personally, I, did you know that I was going to Texas? So you put out that Iron Rattler video this morning or la yesterday just so I would get, I'd get psyched up for it? I went to Texas in uh, late November, early December. So I just yeah. happened to have all that footage ready to go. And Iron Rattler is one of the coasters I wanted to talk about. <laughs> That's uh, that's awesome. I cannot wait to. I've not written it yet, so I I cannot wait. So just a just a short week and a half for me. So hopefully I'll I'll be uh I'll be uh, on that ride soon. So yeah, it's running better than ever now. That the lift doesn't slow down anymore. Yeah, that was cool. I I didn't know that the lift 
it, it, he actually has an entire section about that in the video where he talks about it. So is a programming issue? Is that what you said? Yeah, I always thought it was just to reduce speed in the ride and they turned it off when COVID happened thing. Oh, it's half loaded train. So they needed to boost the ride speed a little bit, but it turns out COVID gave them a chance to actually fix the issue that was there where just the sensor would shut off the lift motor a tad too early. So it would crawl over the top of the motor, a top of the lift. Whereas now it just continues all the way over. You're, you're going to love it. Iron Rattlers. Like I'm sure you talk about this in the video, Mike, but like the, the way they've played with the terrain and the Croy walls, it's just a, Beautiful, beautiful ride. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I, I'm, I'm. His his video is very, is very, was very impressive. So yes, I I know I know I will I will love it. So wait, is that uh, sorry? One last question. So Mike, was that your first RMC? Was Iron Rattler your first RMC? No, uh, Wicked Cyclone was my first RMC. Being from New England, that makes sense. Uh, a lot of my traveling happened once I graduated from college in 2015. So I'd say. I think of my like thousand plus coast credits, I think 600 of them have happened since 2015, just because, you know, when you graduate college, more money, opportunity to travel for work. So it was easier to travel at that point. Whereas college, you know, I had one family road trip a year, the local parks, and then um, I had a co-op in California, which let me hit those parks. But beyond that, um, most of my traveling happened after college. Yeah. Well, that's actually why, or what I'd want to talk about today, because I think looking back, I missed quite a few park opportunities in my travels um, with work and whatnot, because I don't think I've planned very well. So I thought it'd be great if we could spend, you know, just you know, talk about the tips and the tricks and all those things of, of how you've been able to get to that many parks. I mean, that's pretty amazing. So you've got to be the expert. So if we take it just a couple of pieces at a time. Uh, I think it was on one of your live Q&A sessions, you hinted at or talked around how you choose plane flights and then when to drive. So if you could go, you just kind of highlight it. But what I thought was interesting is sometimes you don't look at the closest airport. You look at where you can get the best flight from where you are. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. And so I think a good example of that would be Hollywood Nights. Whereas if I were going to Hollywood Nights, the closest airport is Louisville. Louisville is about an hour from Holiday World. However, I can't get a direct flight there from Boston. So not only is it more expensive, it's gonna take longer. So for Hollywood nights, um, usually I'll fly to uh, Cincinnati or Columbus, Ohio. Yes, it's a bit of a longer drive, but I can pair Kings Island on the trip, so that makes it worth it, and I save money and time. Um, well, I, I do, I, I, I'm one of those people that does that also. I, I, tr I tend to almost sort my Google flights by, I, I limit the connection so it can only have direct or only. So for instance, going to Fiesta, I'm going, I'm flying into Dal Dallas yeah. and then I'm driving down. So I'm going to hit the Six Flags Park on my way back. But because it was, because I get a direct flight there. So it was better for me to drive. So, so I totally understand. So what, how far are you, do you prefer to drive versus fly in the quote unquote radius of, of uh, the area. So it also comes down to a function of how long I have for the trip. So I'd say like um, Bush Gardens Williamsburg is the longest that I have, um, that I usually will drive. Cause I can do that. It's about a 10 hour drive for me, no traffic. So I have to be careful with DC. Um, but if I'm down there for three days, usually I'll leave on Thursday night after work, you know, have Friday, Saturday. And then on Sunday, I'll usually stop at um, either Six Flags America or Six Flags Great Adventure and then head home. Um, oh. Seven hours is, definitely doable because I can do that drive in one sitting. If it's a 10 hour drive, you usually have to do, you know, a seven hour chunk the night before and then three hours the next morning. Uh, so I'd say seven hours is as much as I'm comfortable driving in a day usually. And then 10 hours is the longest I can reasonably do. And, you know, the night before and then the next morning and still get a reasonable amount of sleep. So you kind of look at the map and find a big city in between there at about the three hour spend the spend the night there and then get up the next day and drive the rest of the the rest of the time for your so you're there for opening hours mm -hmm. in the park so i used to book all my hotels in advance if i went on a week trip i'd be like okay i'm staying at you know the quality inn in um washington dc tonight i'm staying at the econo lodge in williamsburg the next night but as i've done more of these road trips i realized i don't like to book the hotels in advance because you really pigeonhole yourself into a specific hotel on that night so you have mm -hmm. no flexibility if you know there's weather issues or the other thing that could happen is say you're at a park and, you know, at the end of the day, you're kind of tired. Just 
I'd rather get a hotel there, get a full night's sleep and start driving in the morning. Or um, like on the Texas trip, there was part of the drive where I had to go from um, Houston to uh, Silver Dollar City. I think that's like a 10 to 11 hour drive. Knew I wasn't making that all in one night. So I started the drive and just see how far I could get. Um, and then eventually it started to rain pretty hard. And I'm sitting there like, okay, I don't want to continue this tonight. And I just got a hotel, I think, randomly in Oklahoma and then continue the drive next morning. That's why I like to book my hotels last minute. When you go to book one, uh, one big tip, try to book it before midnight because it becomes exponentially harder to book it after midnight because a lot of the systems switch over the next day. At that point, you have to start calling hotels and it gets a lot harder. So I'm a points guy. So I tend to like stay at Hilton's with points, stuff like I'm that. A choice guy. Okay. Well, I mean, you, you kind of pick one based on like for me, for work, it, it just tends to be Hilton's. But so uh, do you, do you use points and you find that the points are points matter for the last minute booking or do you just look for the best price? So at least with, uh, I have the choice rewards program. I have their credit card. Um, mm -hmm. Because there are so many choice hotels of all the different levels, you can usually find one relatively cheap. It's just you know, a question, is it right off the highway or do you have to go like, you know, five, 10 minutes out of the way? Mm -hmm. um, and again, usually what I'll do is when I get to the point where it's like, okay, I want to get a hotel in the next hour, I'll stop at like a gas station or, you know, a McDonald's or something. And, you know, while I'm there, I'll check, okay, there's a couple hotels coming up in this stretch. Uh, usually my um, rating system, and I, I look at hotels.com for reviews. I don't want to trust the choice hotels reviews just in case they can uh, scrub those. Um, <laughs> Yeah. I like to see eight out of 10 or better. Um, I'm good with seven out of 10 or better. Um, usually I find if it's in the seven or eight range, it usually means it's like an older, just no frills hotel, but it's usually decent. I won't go with seven or lower. Oh, gotcha. So is it, so with points, I, I know I'm, 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 I'm jumping way ahead to hotels, and, but uh, I find with Hilton sometimes like the different brand of the, is, is the, it's uh, the points aren't, directly related. So sometimes you'll find really good points on a homeway and then the next time it's a Hilton and it's it's weird. It's almost like you got to you got to check with price and then check uh once you've done the done it and narrowed it down by price, you got to look at what it is by points because it can be drastically different. Is yeah, it I'm the same way for choice? I'm not familiar with the Hilton Rewards program, but the way yeah. it works for choice is um they do a lot of promotions where if you like stay twice within, you know, say April or May, you get X amount of points bonus and they don't yeah. care if you stay on a lodge. They don't care if you stay at a quality inn. they don't stay if right. you stay at the highest end hotel. The only right. thing you have to do, you have to have a different hotel every night. So you can't stay at a, like the same hotel for three nights in a row. That all count as one stay. So what I'll typically, and again, cause I like to just sort of plan last minute, unless I'm going to like a hotel that, you know, it's, it's on site and it offers a benefit that I, would be devastated I don't get, or if there's no hotels in the area, that's the one time I will book in advance. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, um, I kind of did a deep dive there on hotels. So if I pull us back to this imaginary trip to holiday nights, are, are, by the way, I, I'm going to go. So Cardin, are you going to go? I really want to. Okay. So let's just pretend we're all booking this. So for me, I'm, I'm within four hours, so I'm going to drive. There's really no reason. So if I go back to your example, uh, Mike, on yours, you're going to fly. Why did you not fly into Indianapolis? Because that seems like it's the biggest airport near there. Uh, trouble getting direct flights from Boston. Ah, okay. So, so you, you just took it. And from, from, your, from your location, based on the flights that you have that you're, you're looking at, which ones you can get direct. Okay, so that's very similar to what I do. So, all right, uh, Cardin, what are you going to do? You're in Orlando. I would fly. I'm not as picky as you guys, I feel like. I will <laughs> fly to the <laughs> closest airport, rent the cheapest rental car, and then drive. <laughs> All right. Well, all right. I'll leave well, the travel hacking to y'all. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, if you do fly in, do a Legion because you can, I'll, I'll pick you up and you can ride with me over because we have direct right. to Orlando. Perfect. All right. So, all right. So we're all there. This is a little unusual, right? Because this one is one of those ones where you know you want to stay for the night rides on yeah. Voyage and stuff, right? So, in that instance, you've guaranteed yourself you're going to stay. and You would just go ahead. Are you going to book a book a hotel room ahead of time, or 
So for Hollywood nights, usually I will book a hotel for the Friday night because, you know, I know I'm going to be there that next Saturday again, no matter what. So especially because I know that that area is getting a huge influx of coaster enthusiasts. And if you go to the hotels that week, you see a lot of fellow coaster enthusiasts there. Um, oh, yeah. So that's one hotel I'll book, you know, more advanced than usual because I know I'm going to be there for sure. Um, yeah. If you want to stay at that, um, the lodges they have, those are the most popular just because, you know, you literally can walk right over to the park. I usually stay at, um, uh, last year I stayed at a quality inn that was 15 minutes down the road that was really nice. Just the one thing you have to watch out there is Holiday World is so close to the switchover between the central and eastern time zone. You need to figure out what time zone your hotel is in. Like last year, the hotel I was in, my hotel was eastern time. The Wendy's across the street was central. That's how close it was to the border. Wow. Wow. Okay. I, I want to say I have that reserve so here, look into that because I think it's I think that might be the hotel I reserved because I reserved the hotel room already. So, man, I never would have thought of that. So do you have any rule of thumb of when you know that it's going to be busy? Because it kind of contradicts your statement earlier where you said you can always find a hotel last minute. You're just going to drive and stop wherever. Yep. So the difference becomes like if I know I'm going to be in Santa Claus in Vienna on that night. Uh, you know, I know Santa Claus in Vienna, they're really... I think there's only the Santa's Lodge Hotel and the one that's with Holiday World. Yeah. And then uh, some of the cities around there, like I think it's I think it's Rockport, Kentucky, or I've stayed in one of those towns before. Um, again, I just know I'm going to be there, so that's why I don't mess around at the hotel. Whereas if I'm doing a longer drive, like say I'm going from Holiday World to back to Cincinnati, I know there's going to be plenty of hotels in the way, and I don't necessarily care, if, you know, if I stop in Corydon, Indiana, or Louisville, Kentucky, or down by Mason, Ohio, necessarily. I know I'm yes. going to stop at the hotel. Like okay, example, so, last summer, oh yeah, go ahead. last summer, um, my girlfriend and I, we were going to go up to uh, Storyland and do like the White Mountain stuff, but there was no availability for hotels that weekend. And that's an example of you know a, a tourist area that doesn't have major cities around it. So you sort of have to scope out: is there a major city near there? If the answer is no, it can be a bit harder to find a hotel if you truly want to be near that place. So make sure you take a look at Google Maps and see if there's any big, big locations near you. Do you got any pro tips? I'm a, I'm a carry on kind of guy and I'm a pretty much a minimalist. So I, I tend to pack pretty light and put everything in one bag. Uh, is that, do you have any tips for the plane and for baggage? So if it doesn't fit in my backpack, it doesn't go. <laughs> that's wait a, really that's amazing just that one backpack no so suitcase? most of my trips are you know like four day trips so i can easily fit it in that backpack if i'm going on like a week-long trip i will usually try to bring a, a bag but like i went to europe with just that with just that backpack <laughs> wow that's amazing wait what do you do during the day do you do you have like a day pack or do you just stuff your pockets full of stuff if it doesn't fit in my pocket, I don't bring it into the park. There are exceptions. For example, Holiday World, I know that they let you bring yourself up to the platform and I want to go to the water park. So I'll bring a bag in that case. Um, but like the Cedar Fair parks, uh, the, especially the ones that force you to get lockers on the rides, if it doesn't fit in my uh, pockets, it's not coming in with me. Nice. I have a question. And John, this goes for you too, but I'll start with Mike. Mike, do you have a pair of coaster pants and coaster shorts? Yeah, so by that, I know what the weather is. Uh, I have shorts okay. for, you know, if it's comfortable to wear shorts uh, with double zippers on both sides. I had to look hard to find those on Amazon. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> nice. And then if it's more winter, I have several jackets with uh, double zipper pockets. Oh, I didn't think about that. It's been a long time since I've been to a cold. I'm used to park in the cold. <laughs> yeah. Says the jackets, Florida you guy. Hold so much more stuff. Because usually I'm going to the parks here in Florida. I, I can stuff like my cargo shorts with a couple things and, and some buttons and zippers. But I do have a specific pair of shorts that are my roller coaster shorts. So I was curious if that was a, a more of a thing. John, do you have yes. roller coaster pants? I do have a pair of shorts I always wear. And the same, they, I can't remember if they have zippers on both, but but one side definitely has two sets of zippers. So I can definitely, because I lost my phone in one of my pockets on uh, in Six Flags St. Louis. And actually, they actually found it. And I, had, I went back the next week <laughs> to get to get it. So after that, I've, I've always, I always only put it in zippers. Even if, even if they're the cargo with the flip over, I, I still will only put it in zipper pockets. 
Yeah, I don't trust those like button charts. And I think a good example of that was I was at Silver Dollar City for their Christmas event and I have a double jacket. Um, my winter coat has double zippers on it. So I felt confident my phone in there for Outlaw Run. GP2 Enthusiast was there that weekend. He actually lost his phone in Outlaw Run, made a video about how he lost his phone. And he had a button pocket and Outlaw Run ripped right through the button. Yeah, I always uh, find myself get nervous when I have the button one. And I feel like I spend too much time focusing on holding my pockets instead of actually enjoying the ride. So mm -hmm. highly agree with the zipper thing. That's yeah. Really smart. And because I'm in Illinois, I also have a, it was actually a shirt that I got from um, doing the grand Canyon. So it's like one of those hiking shirts where it's got the, it's got a couple of pockets that zip shut and then you can roll the sleeves up and it's vented. So I always take that into the parks, even if it's half, you know, if it's, you know, like even gonna, like once the sun goes down, it's just six flags in Chicago are both, both regular parks for me and they always get cold at night. So I usually bring that even if I'm not, even if I'm not, uh, even if it's quote unquote summer, even if I'm wearing shorts, I'll have long sleeves usually. Yeah. It's a com it's a common thing, I think. Uh, and, and the, the button, it seems to be on how wide the pocket is. The one that my phone fell out of, it's because the pocket was wide. And on the G's, it just kind of slid out. The little kind of made itself its own little opening and slid out. So, Yeah, the way, my, the way my pockets are is I'll put like my camera, my phone, my wallet, my keys in the zipper. Because if I lose those, I would be, you know, very angry in the <laughs> button pocket because I can't fit everything in the zipper. Like that's where I'll put the sunscreen. If I lose sunscreen... Not exactly devastated if I have to replace that. Not to mention sunscreen, you know, it's a soft bottle. So if it by some chance did come out, it's at least not a hard projectile. Yeah. I yeah. just think my funniest story with loose articles was uh, I went to Steel Vengeance opening year when they were, you know, they were very strict, no loose articles in the queue line. It was specifically no metal objects. So I had to put, get a locker for my phone, my keys, uh, my wallet. But I brought a folded up Sports Illustrated magazine for to prepare for my fantasy football draft. It was bulging out of my pocket. And I'm just like, so wait, I can bring this in line? Yeah, there's no metal in it. So I'm lying steel bench with this giant like bulge out of my pocket for a magazine. They don't care about that. And I just found that funny. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. That's hilarious. That's dedication, man. That's dedication to, to some fantasy football. I mean, the line was an hour, hour and a half. I mean, what else was I going to do? I couldn't take pictures of the ride. I was there alone because I had just left uh, Pittsburgh for work. There was nothing else to really do in that line. <laughs> All right. Oh, awesome. that, that is pretty funny because uh, it gets boring if you have to check everything, right? And you actually have to talk to people in line. It's one thing if you're there with friends and family, but like if I'm there alone and, you know, I don't always want to strike up a conversation with, you know, the random family behind me or the person in front of me. You no, know, sometimes you can tell if there's a coaster enthusiast in front of you, you know, if they're wearing, you know, you know, a, a shirt with a coaster on, they're probably willing to talk, especially about coasters, but, you know, I don't want to disrupt, you know, if there's a group behind me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so we spent a lot of time on lodging. Is there any other lodging tips? I think we, we talked about when to book. We talked about, um, we talked about uh, wrote a couple of different reward programs based on what, you know, what you, you go to a lot. But what about uh, on-site? You mentioned on-site perks, and then we kind of just kind of glossed over that. Yeah, for me with on-site, it just comes down to, can I get an experience on-site that I cannot get elsewhere? And is it, is it worth it? So a good example of this would be Efteling over in the Netherlands. Efteling does not have a skip the line option. So if you want to maximize your chance to ride things, if you stay on-site, you get ERT in the morning. Same with Europa Park. Not to mention those hotels are really nice and affordable too. Um, whereas if you look at, for example, Dollywood in the US, um, the benefits of staying on site there is you get complimentary time saver. Well, looking at the cost of that hotel, it's cheaper for me to stay at you know another hotel in Pigeon Forge and then just buy time saver myself. In that case, the benefits of um, the Dollywood Resort, Dream World Resort, don't outweigh the cost to stay there. But some of those parks in Europe, those do outweigh, those are better. Or another example in the U.S., like I will stay on site at Disney World because you get the, well, granted, they're getting rid of the extra magic hour, but, you know, you used to get those extra magic hours. Um, but I wouldn't stay on site in California because those hotels were so ridiculously expensive. And you can basically stay at like a Quality Inn on Catella or Ball Ave and walk right to the park. So it feels like you're on site. And because of the way it's set up there with the fast pass system, you can ride pretty much everything you want. and You don't get that much of a benefit staying on site. 
Yeah, I, for the most part, Disney, we stayed on, on site and they still had the, the hours. Um, but Cedar Point staying at Breakers, man, that Cedar Point is one of those ones where it's, the hotels are a little bit farther away and staying on site, man, that was, that was probably worth it. I don't know if you, if you looked at Cedar Point. So I've done a few different ways at Cedar Point. I've stayed at Breakers. I did that. Um, <clears throat> my most recent visit with my girlfriend because she doesn't have a season pass like I do. Um, so I need to stay there to get her early entry to the park in the morning, not to mention it, you know, it was a nice hotel. Um, when I went by myself for work, I stayed at the Econo Lodge right at the end of the uh, causeway. A, that Econ you have to be careful with the Econo Lodge is there. The one at the end of the causeway is really good. There's another one nearby. It's a disaster. Um, but if you have a platinum pass, you get early entry anyway. So the only thing you save, and you get free parking. So the only thing you save is, you know, it's only a 10 minute drive at the end of the day, which I don't mind doing. Yeah. No matter how exhausted you are, 10 minutes is you're, you're almost there. So, all right. Not well, to, that's cool. to your point, I actually think it works better for what I like to do in the morning, staying off site because most people run to steal vengeance, but you can't get that many rides on that in the morning. I like to park by the main entrance, walk down past blue street to the Marina gate so that we can ride uh, millennium force you know, pretty much with no weight in the front row as many times as you want at the beginning of the day. Hmm. Whereas if you're at the hotel, that is a bit of a cumbersome one to get to because you have to walk down past Gatekeeper all the way around um, and then go to the Marina Gate. So you basically double your walking. Ooh, I, I like that tip. That's a that's a good one because yeah, that's... Millennium Force, that line gets really, really long by the end of the day. Oh, I love the Magic Gate. You can see that in the morning. It makes your day. All right. Well, while we're uh, talking about parks, um, sometimes that's the hardest thing, right, uh, is the parks. So, so far, you've talked a lot about season passes. Mm -hmm. uh, do you just like have season passes for all the brands? So I have season passes for Cedar Fair and Six Flags. I know I'm going to go to both those parks a lot and multiple other parks. Um, I have a season pass to Lake Compounds because it's one of my local parks. Um, and I go there solely for Boulder Dash. Um, the one interesting thing this year, they added a Park Ace reunion dose pass good at all their U.S. parks. So I'm going to upgrade to that so I can get Kennywood this year. And it's also good for like Dutch Wonderland and some of the water parks nearby in Storyland as well. Um, I heard I heard about that, but it's it's that's a weird tiered one, right? Is that the new one that's – when you say upgrade, what do you mean by upgrade? So I have the um, – I think I have the mid-tier late compound season pass, and it's going to cost me an extra, I think, twenty to thirty dollars to upgrade to the to the highest tier that will get me all the parks. Like looking at that, that's admission to Storyland right there, so that pays for itself already. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Do you always do the skip ahead line thing, or so that's a function of a few things. One, how much time do I have at the park? Um, two, what day am I going, and how long are the lines? And um, three, what do I want to get done at the park? So for me, uh, just a few examples. Like I went to Worlds of Fun in the summer. I had been there and I had um, a full day mostly. I had to leave in the middle of the day, take some calls for work. But, you know, I was mostly there open to close, left in the middle of the day for two or three hours. If I needed to get a skip the line pass to get on rides there, I would have done it. But the longest line I saw there was like 10 minutes for Patriot. So didn't think that was worth skipping that line. Um, so you always wait till you see the lines and then make the decision? Usually there are exceptions. The exceptions are if I know the park will sell out of skip the line passes. This happened with uh, Kings Island this year a lot with uh, Fast Lane Plus. In the past, you could show up to any Cedar Fair Park, buy Fast Lane there, and you know they would never run out of it. And like if you look at Cedar Point in past years, the Steel Vengeance skip the line, uh, Fast Lane line got above an hour some days, so they weren't limiting it. But this year they were limiting it at Kings Island. So um, if you didn't buy it a few days in advance, you were out of luck and you'd have to wait an hour long lines there. Yeah, this is an abnormal year, probably. Cedar Cedar, mm -hmm. Cedar Fair in general had, a, because of the social distancing, has a lot more lines than I think normal. But a more traditional one is Dollywood. And the good thing with Dollywood is online, they will explicitly say how many time saver and limiteds they're selling in a day. Um, so if you look online for a specific day, it'll say, you know, 250 left or 10 left. And so my rule of thumb with Dollywood, if lightning rod's running, I'm getting a skip the line pass because I've seen that ride closed way too many times. 
to miss riding if it's open. Yeah, I've never I've never been able to catch it yet. It's on my list. Fifty percent success rate. <laughs> <laughs> and you're close. You're closer. I'm closer to Silver City in Illinois. I mean, it's it's not really an easy park for me to get to because that's an example of Knoxville's the closest airport. Not an easy airport to fly to. So usually I have to fly to Charlotte or Atlanta, drive four hours to Dollywood. Um, and the first time I rode Lightning Rod was kind of funny because the week before I had uh, torn my ankle playing Ultimate Frisbee. And so I'm sitting there, I'm like, great, Lightning Rod's actually running and I won't be able to ride. I'm just sitting there like, you know what? Just I'm just going to take a bunch of Advils and limp into the park and deal with it. Oh, wow. Because that so was a perfect just... example of Dollywood lists what they have available in advance. They were out of wheelchairs on the day where I was going, so I had no option for that. Um, oh, yeah, that's a lot oh. of walking. Not if you stay at Lightning Rod all day. Okay. <laughs> True. If you just just looped it. Looped it. Yep. That's funny. Uh, Gardner, yeah, I was going to ask, when you go to a park, how do you choose what to prioritize? Like, are you strictly coasters or do you like to dabble in like a flat ride dark ride area too so typically what i do and I, this is probably way too more too much detail compared to what most people do before i go to a park i basically have uh, like google docs on my phone i'll make a list of anything i want to get on so i classify into three groups must rides really want to rides and want to rides so must rides are the ones i'd be devastated if i leave the park and don't get on really want to ride are usually like i'd say the mid-tier credits that they might be clones at other parks but i do like those clones so i'll want to do it the want to ride to the nice things that I, you know, like a Ferris wheel or, um, you know, if the log flume is just okay. Um, and then basically I'll prioritize based off that. And I'll do my research in advance to figure out, okay, if I'm going to, um, for an example, would be Michigan's Adventure. There's two schools of thought. One, go on Shivering Timbers right away. God forbid that ride closes. The other school of thought is you look at that park, that park barely has any lines except for two things. Mad Mouse and Wolverine Wildcat, because those have by far the worst capacities. So when I went to that park, Mad Mouse was closed because it somehow valued on the hairpin turns. Um, so I went to Wolverine Wildcat first, rode that before it got a line, and then could marathon Shivering Timbers. How do you know? How did you know those two? You said you did some research online. So uh, there's qtimes.com um, that basically lists all, uh, all the major chain parks, and you can actually look up historical wait times for several of them. So you can look it up and see, okay, if I'm going to, um, you know, Hershey Park, what ride tends to get the longest wait time? Um, and if huh. you can actually open it up in some cases where it'll keep track of the um, wait time by day. So like if you look at Hershey Park's Candemonium, Candemonium's line right after the park opens is usually like an hour to two hours because it's right at the main entrance. But every single day around two or three o'clock, everyone's made it back in the park. Candemonium's line shoots down to, you know, 15 minutes. And so... Some so of it, them are years so it, tra it tracks it over time of the day even. Yep. Some parks are, le they're relying on what data the park gives. So especially in 2020, some Six Flags parks were kind of lazy and just said if rides were open or closed, so you don't get that information anymore. Yeah, but other parks, like Disney especially, are good at listing their wait time all throughout the day. Same with Universal. Yeah. That's so, so. Cardin, he knows about this because he tracks the wait times for the log ride app. So they're just taking that statistically and then and, and they're making averages based on that. So that's cool. And you said that was uh, qtimes.com? Yep. Did I write that down right? Awesome. q-times.com. Q yep, I just put it in the chat. Yeah. Ah, perfect. So, awesome. I'll put that nice. in the show notes to make sure we got there. So just for the record, we don't think that's weird that you, <laughs> you made a document document no, because uh, fact, I'll say this it sounds like you could actually benefit from the log ride list function on the app you can actually go in and, and make different lists of attractions and you could do like a must ride don't necessarily need to ride list so. mm -hmm. the especially the benefit with that is if I know I'm traveling for work and I only have say three hours at a park before I have to go catch a flight or something I, I really have to avoid getting stuck in a long line or you really shoot yourself in the foot, especially if you're at a park that doesn't offer a skip the line option or you're there for so little time, it's not worth it. So like, for example, uh, when I went to SeaWorld a few years ago, did my research in advance, so, oh, crack in his VR. I should probably do that right away before that line backs up. Um, so I usually just try to do some research and figure out, you know, which ride's going to get the longest wait time. 
and figure out, okay, at rope drop, where am I going? So that way I hopefully don't get stuck in a long line at the start of the day because that really sets you back on everything. Okay. So uh, I'm picturing this in my head. I got the word doc. I got it in my three, my three buckets and then you're putting rope drop. And then are you looking at the map at all to kind of, to, to plan out your uh, loop or anything, or you just do it based on, on timing and when the ride's available? Usually for me, it's figuring out, okay, if, if I'm going to a park, is there one ride that's going to be prohibitively hard to get on? Or um, does it make sense to run to something right away? So like, Kennywood this past year, I knew Skyrocket was on one train from, you know, browsing some of the theme park forums and seeing people complaining about that. And that rides right at the main entrance. So I knew for that one, I had to get to Kennywood, you know, a half hour before opening, do Sky, Skyrocket right away. And I'm glad I did because that line got up to an hour, hour and a half right when the park opened. And then I was able to go back and do Exterminator before that line built up because especially in 2020, I didn't want to be stuck in a confined building for an hour. <laughs> totally. Totally. So right there, you said I might hop to a park for three hours right before I catch a flight. Do you mind talking You know, a little bit about like how you kind of tack those on before and after? If, let's say I, you got a work trip, just make up of destinations. Kind of talk, talk us just a little bit of tips on that. Yeah. So it, so when you're traveling for work, you're kind of constrained by, okay, if I have to work in the office, you know, eight to four o'clock and I get to a park at five, I worked during the day. So any bonus park time that day, I'm not complaining if I get, you know, only two hours at a park. An example that would be like, we have a factory out in Pennsylvania. I finished with work at four, drove to Knobles, got there at five o'clock. Yeah. I didn't get a full day at Knobles, but I had been there before. So I focused on, you know, riding Phoenix, Twister and the stuff I liked. Um, but a different example is I had to go out to, um, Washington for work and, uh, I ended up going to wild waves while I was out there and I only had three hours in the afternoon. Did I know how busy that park was going to be? No. Uh, but basically I looked at it and said, okay, as long as I get on Timberhawk, I'm happy. And turns out the park, you know, had 10, 15 minute waits at worst. So it wasn't a problem. But really, it's just going in with the mentality, what do you think you're going to accomplish? And I try to be a little conservative. So that way, I'm pleasantly surprised if I get on anything else. Nice. You just kind of look at the location you're going to be at, just search for, for parks near there and around there, and then just kind of make your list based on that. Or do you do so, it based on? So typically, what I do is I have uh, an Excel spreadsheet on like my most desired coaster credits out there. And I also have a uh, Google My Maps that uh, plots, you know, um, it plots all the parks and have a color code system for like, um, I have one symbol. that means I've been to the park, but they have a new ride I want to go back for. And I have another one for, it's a park I haven't been to. And the different colors I pick depends upon, you know, do I really like that park? Is it just okay? And then, or if I haven't been there, how much do I want to go there? Wow. So and, you maintain it to where you change the color once you've been there. Yep. Nice. <laughs> nice. It'll effort, but I'd rather do that than, you know, miss out on, uh, you know, a place like Stricker's Grove or, you know, a smaller example going to Portland for work. If I hadn't paid close attention over the years, I wouldn't have known that Seaside, Oregon had a pair of loose bumper cars, you know, an hour and a half west of there. Also with a fascination parlor right there. And I think that town also has a kitty coaster now that probably makes it easier for people to find on RCDB. But before that, <laughs> you just had to know those bumper cars existed. Yeah, I'm I'm amazed. You're you have like an encyclopedia of knowledge. Um, I don't think we have time to hit international, so maybe I'll try to to convince you to come back again sometime, and uh, we could do a deep dive on international because I have a feeling you've got a whole another set of nuggets and tips and tricks for when you're overseas. And I think uh, Cardin would love to. Let's say that's his wheelhouse also. So I would love to talk about that next time. I do have one more question before we drop off then if we're not going to go into the international stuff. So you keep mentioning your, you do research beforehand and um, like, what are the different sources you use online? So it depends, um, depends what type of um, research you're asking about. So in terms of like crowds or touring plans, like I'll usually look up a YouTube video to try and find someone who recently visited a park and posted a vlog about it so I can just skip around and see, okay, they got stuck in a long line here. The park looked busy there. Um, if you type in, you know, like, um, for example, Kennywood wait times, you might get something that pops up in theme park review or um, coaster buzz or, you know, any website for me, 
it matters how recent the information is and how time, you know, and how it relates to the, my visit specifically if it's around a holiday rather than necessarily going to one site over another. Um, that's how I typically view that. What about for the attraction side? Like you mentioned with the loose bumper cars. Uh, that was just an example of, I had seen a trip report posted on that, you know, probably a decade ago. And I just made a mental note about that. When I made my Google, um, my maps, I put that on there. So when I traveled to Portland for work and pulled it up, I saw, okay, what's in this area? Uh, Enchanted Forest, Oaks Park. Oh, and these bumper cars, uh, might as well do those while I'm here too. That That is That's awesome. It's really impressive. I love it. I love the detail. Yeah, for sure. That's it's uh, <laughs> we're we're all kind of I mean, all the, everybody who's dedicated or, or an enthusiast is, is pretty impressed with that. And I, and I think what's really cool is you've been doing that for so long. You've created this master list of stuff, um, and that you've groomed it throughout the years. It's it's almost like this living and breathing document. So it's it's pretty cool. So. The only thing I'd add, uh, just I know we're not going to cover international in full, but a, a key thing to note, um, <clears throat> public transportation internationally, it tends to be a lot better than it is domestically. Like if I do a domestic trip, I don't even think about looking at public transit usually because it's so inefficient and it doesn't really work too well. Whereas if I go overseas, I know public transportation is going to be a viable option. Not to mention yeah. just the complications of possibly driving overseas. Mm -hmm. That's a discussion in its own, you know, I've done it, but it's, uh, you have to do a little bit of research there and, uh, the car might not be what you're used to. <laughs> oh, for True sure. That, yeah. For sure. I've, I, it's always weird driving on the other side of the road. For example, in Europe, you have so many roundabouts, which I have a lot of those in Boston. So those didn't phase me, but what did catch me off guard is they have these, uh, one way streets with these yield signs. And if I didn't look up what those signs meant in advance, I would have been confused and probably the biggest jerk on the road. Basically, depending upon if they're black or red, red means you have to yield to oncoming traffic. Black means you have the right of way. So you'd approach these one way uh, roads through the middle of town, and you'd either have to stop or you just keep going right through, depending what color you get. Oh, and and you don't want to be the guy that slows down when you got the you know you got the go ahead because <laughs> then the people behind you miss. <laughs> or another thing that I'm glad I looked at is you know over here used to oh there's a speed limit of you know 50 or there's always a speed limit. Certain parts of Germany, uh, there isn't a speed limit. And, no. no, I remember and that. Know, as there's just this blank sign on the side of the road, which I looked at, I'm like, oh, what? why is there a blank sign? Oh, that means literally no speed limit. Okay. Oh, yeah. I remember my first time on the Audubon, and I had a uh, so, some, some, some car come up on me. And, man, if you are passing somebody, and you're in the fast lane, and you're going slower than them, they're flicking their lights at you. I mean, you just <laughs> – it's a, it's amazing how fast they come up on you when they have a nice car and you're in a rental. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, when you're going a hundred miles per hour in the slow lane, uh, that just, and people are still whizzing past you. That just says a lot about how they drive over there. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Okay. See, look, I think the international one is going to be exciting. <laughs> we got plenty of stuff to talk oh, about. Sure. We've all been overseas. So, all right. Um, I'm, if you've never been to his YouTube channel, you got to go. Uh, there'll be links in the show notes. Um, we'll go out there and that's pretty amazing. Just think about that, a new video every day and he's been to 200 parks. So you, you gotta follow him. It's not just coasters, it's flat rides and dark rides and water park stuff. So it's all of the thrills. Yeah, I mean, that goes back to what you prioritize in a park where, you know, I like I like theming and thrills. So for me, it's going to a park, only riding the coasters and leaving. That's not really something I like doing. You know, yeah. I'll do if I'm going to like a boardwalk park in New Jersey that you know, it's basically a permanent carnival. But like if I'm going to most parks, I want to spend at least a half day there so I can do not only the coasters, but, you know, the non-coasters, like a good one world is a fun. Cyclone Sands. If you only care about coasters, you're not going to know that ride exists. Cyclone Sands is a really fun indoor flat ride that's probably one of the better rides in the park. Yeah. Awesome. Well, there you go. go subscribe right now. Any uh, parting words? Uh, thanks for inviting me on the show. Um, hopefully the tips that are provide help people plan their trips, especially, I guess, if they're going to Hollywood Nights this year. A great event. Um, highly recommend it. I've gone the past two years. I All think right. I'll be going this year, but I'm just waiting to see what happens with just the um, vaccine rollout in Massachusetts. All right. Well, I've got my reservations. So if you end up going, uh, me and my daughter, my eight-year-old 
daughter uh, is a coaster enthusiast also. So we'll, we'll be there. So we'll Mike, to... whenever I start making the trek up north, I'm going to be calling you asking for tips. So be ready. Okay, sounds good. Yeah. Uh, the New England parks are, uh, you know, know those parks exceptionally well, considering I grew up around them. Um, I love yeah. it. And next time you're back down in Florida or Georgia, hit me up and we'll, we'll go hang out. Well, so if you're in Georgia, quick question. Does uh, Cannonball Lake Winnipesaukee, is that usually open late or is that, or have I just been unlucky? Uh, I have no idea. That's a great question. Have you had bad luck with it? <laughs> yeah. So my plan with that park was to get in and out quickly because I was doing Alabama Adventure the same day. Well, my plane got shot in the foot when uh, Cannonball didn't open early because they were still walking the track on that ride. Um, and they didn't open until like two or three hours late. So uh, I've heard that that's not the first time that's happened. And this was Labor Day weekend too. So that's why I want to get there, get on that early and get out. But nope. <laughs> All right. Well, if anyone knows the answer to that, send us a, a message because I'm curious as well. Yeah, throw it in the show notes. Definitely. All right. Well, tune in next week. We'll continue to bring in news and uh, guest appearances. And like I said, we'll have Mike back uh, pretty soon on uh, Talk International. So. All right. Take us out, Carden. <laughs> All right. Don't forget to check us out at thrillsecretspodcast.com. Until next time. Thanks so much. Bye. See you.